So it's my pleasure now to introduce to you Don Tolman. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Don and, uh, and his background. Um, actually, bef before that also, I might just pick up on what Paul Zane Pills was talking about, about uh, wellness. Because currently in America right now, there are two uh, trillion dollar industries. And the first one, anyone would like to take a guess what it might be? Fast food. Fast food industry is a trillion dollar industry in the States. The second trillion dollar industry is kind of fed by the fast food industry, and that's the pharmaceutical industry. Now, they say that the next trillion dollar industry will be wellness. And it's all about the premise that people are realizing that their health is the most valuable asset that they have. And it's going to be driven by the baby boomer population. And as they go into retirement, they want to be able to prolong the life that they have and to be able to um, you know, continue to, sort of, you know, to keep up with the, the fast-paced world. So they're sort of looking now at more uh, prevention as opposed to waiting until they get sick and something actually happens. They're, they're trying to take more proactive um, positioning with regards to their health, which kind of leads perfectly into the message that we have for you with Don Tolman. Now, I first saw Don Tolman speak, would be close to nine years ago, and I remember when I saw him, I was absolutely captivated by just this man and, and who he actually is, and you'll kind of get why as uh, he begins his presentation and, and shows you a couple of you know, cool things that uh, he does in relation to uh, you know, the memory and also using your mind. Uh, but he's an, a world-renowned expert in whole food medicine. He's an author and uh, speaker. He now uh, travels the world, speaks to thousands and thousands of people every year. Uh, he also works with a number of uh, prestigious universities now as a, as a lecturer and as, a, as an advisor to, um, for many people that are in the medical industry. Um, he's also uh, regularly featured in the media, and in fact, this week he's going to be interviewed on Today Tonight. Uh, so, you know, make sure that you tune in um, because it's going to be, yeah, quite an interesting uh, presentation. Once you see what Don's message is, it's really kind of going to, you know, rock the foundations of uh, a lot of people's belief systems. So, it's going to be uh, um, definitely something that you're going to want to check out this week. So, that's on uh, Today Tonight. Um, look out for it. Um, and he's also got some, uh, some fruit up here as well. He's going to talk a little bit about food and the signatures of food. Uh, who's actually seen Don Tomlin speak before? Yeah, then you'd probably know that uh, you know, now when I you know, cook dinner, I never, never cut a carrot or cut a tomato without thinking about Don and, and Don's message, right? Who's the same as me, right? You think about, oh, that's for this and this is for that. And you'll, you'll see that all explained in just a few moments' time. So I'm really looking forward to this presentation, as I'm sure many of you are as well. He's come all the way from Utah to be here. So let's give him a very, very big Sydney welcome. Let's put our hands together for Don Tolman. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Hey, thanks. <laughs> How are you? I like the music. That's nice. <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> good. Yeah, I know. You're thinking, what the heck did I stay for an ugly guy like that for? They took my picture in a Photoshop and cleaned it up a little bit, you can tell, huh? And I want to get it made right up front so you understand, so your mind isn't struggling with it over the next few minutes that we have together. Everybody that sees me, even total strangers on the street, they'll look at me and they'll stop me and they say, how do you get your mustache like that? <laughs> and I just shoot straight with them right from the very front. I say, I dye this white. <laughs> Babe. You gotta leave the mustache alone. <laughs> anyway, what a pleasure to be here. How many in the audience have heard me speak uh, live before? Wow, oh, I'm gonna be preaching to the choir. Oh no, it's great to have you here, and it's so good to see so many wonderful, familiar faces. Uh, if there's anything that I love, it's the Australians, and I say that from the bottom of my heart because I believe, honestly, that it's going to be the citizenship of the Australian people that can bring us back to some reality as we move into the 21st century. I, I feel like in the United States we've kind of lost it in so many ways. 
And what breaks my heart sometimes is I feel like we keep pushing our crap you onto you. It's kind of nice having music no. in the background, isn't it? Yeah. I just hope they don't put on any stripping music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Seeing me would scar you for life. <laughs> that would not be a good memory right there. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be jumping into this thing and uh, getting into some things that I hope that you will find logical and simple and reasonable. One thing I've come to understand in my life is that if things aren't simple, it's probably not true. Complexity is created in so many industries to create fear. And then with that fear, they use it to bully you and to get you to do what it is they want you to do. And I do lecture at a lot of medical symposiums. I'm invited into medical clinics. I speak in front of a lot of medical doctors and scientists within that industry, if there's such a thing. And I say that just simply because within the pharmaceutical medical industry there is what is referred to as publishing prejudice. Most people aren't even aware that if you have a drug you want to bring to market, you pay a laboratory and tell them the result that you want. And if they don't give you the result that you're looking for, they don't get paid. In their own published medical journals, of empirical evidence, of clinical studies that have been peer-reviewed, they openly admit, and across the board, 70% inaccuracy. Medical tests can get as high as 96% inaccuracy. Blood tests have one of the highest inaccuracies that there is, showing false positives to a condition. Hmm. Makes me wonder if there's money in treating symptoms of disease. And in fact, in the United States alone, as of 2009, it's a $4.6 trillion annual industry. We take more prescription and over-the-counter drugs in the United States than all of the other countries on the earth put together. And we do this every year. And yet the Surgeon General of the United States stood up in national media and declared, we are the sickliest generation of Americans to have ever lived. What? We take more medical drugs than anybody else. If they're that good for you, how come we're not the healthiest little critters on the planet? We're the fattest. We're the most disease. Hell, in the United States, when I start talking about whole food, they think I'm talking about eating a whole donut. It's true. And then washing it down with horse urine. Oh, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola. Most people don't even know the number one ingredient in Coca-Cola is phosphoric acid. Google it. Find out where they get it. You're drinking horse pee every time you have one. But people don't care. They just don't care. They just want to be able to wash down their donut. And so it's kind of interesting, the things we don't know and we don't understand. As I go into this thing, I'm going to be saying some things that I know that some people in this room are going to find very offensive and you're going to feel an intoleration towards me because it'll be perspectives that may be in opposition to your own belief that you have right now. But I just want you to know right up front as I jump into this, I'm not here to intentionally offend anyone. If anything, I love people. I do. I enjoy people. I talk to total strangers on the street every day. And the people that follow me around, the team, they all see it. I'll get on an elevator. And I'll actually say, hi, how you doing? <laughs> Damn, you should see some of those. <laughs> Just waiting for their floor. <laughs> Good grief. We're the best trained little sheeple on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do what anybody in authority tells us to do. We believe in authority. You got letters on the front of your name or after your name. You must know what you're doing. Just tell me what to do and I'll jump in and do it. Because I'm just a good little <laughs> cheap. 
So interesting. But what if the truth is in the 21st century that all authority is absolutely false? All of it. What if the only real authority that has ever existed is the truth? What if nobody has to tell you something is true? What if that's something you naturally, automatically know with every fiber of your being? We feel the truth. The hard part for some of us is when we hear a truer truth, it's hard to let go and take the blinders off. A lot of us like to act like I didn't see that. That would mean I'd have to change. I can't go there. I'm going to hang on to the truth I have. The hardest part is when you embrace truer truth, and then all of a sudden you come across what every one of our ancestors in their own vernacular of their tongue spoke in the ancient world as 24 karat gold nuggets of truest truth. Truest truth. That doesn't change. It's solid. It's foundational. You can stand on it. You can trust it. It's not going to change. And if you ever come across truest truth, so many people, because of the way we have been academically indoctrinated in our little factory schools, where we chant learn pre-selected answers to stick in blanks on exams put into place by multinational corporations within that educational facility. We're such good little chant learners. We memorize the answers to put in blanks. We get a grade. And after eight years at uni, we think we're somebody. The word education means a deepening of insight. Look it up in a pre-1940s dictionary before the book burnings took place in every modern country in the world during World War II for a very specific agenda and reason. It's published in the Library of Congress in the United States and most of the collections national. Things went on in order, I believe, to get the support and the control of the masses. And so we're trained into certain things and because it comes from authority, we think we know what they're doing. So whenever I speak, like Johns Hopkins or Cornell Medical or UCLA Port or out there at uh, University of Florida Gainesville in the oncological studies, whenever I'm in front of a medical symposium, and it used to be I would never be invited. I was the enemy in the camp. They all know I hate their guts. I make no bones about it. We're doing more harm than good. And I'm not saying there aren't sincere practitioners of the pharmaceutical medical industry. The problem is you can be sincerely wrong and not know it. You can be doing more harm than good because all of the published studies, even with their own community, shows people do not die of cancer. They die of the treatments of cancer. I've never met any human in my life that died of cancer, but I've met thousands that have died of the treatment. I also know thousands that laid down that path and took a different route, and they're still alive to this day because they embraced principles of self-care. Here's what happened. Before you were born, your mommy and daddy got together for a bit of fun. <laughs> Next thing that was going on and nobody could see it, you in the identity of a sub-sub-sub par particle, as they referred to it in the 600s BC, Democritus and others, when they were theorizing about atoms. They took the word from the Egyptian culture, the NTR, the Niter, the identity of you, a particle that is the smallest and not dividable. That's what individual means, not dividable. Today's physicists are still looking for, is there a particle that you cannot divide? Uh, they had it figured out a long time ago, guys. The identity of you took materials from your mom and your dad and organized through the intelligence that it brought into this cave of creation and wonders today called the womb and developed a cell within about seven days. 
The next seven days, it went into mitosis, split into two cells. Next seven days, doubled into four, then to six. I mean, to eight. I I'm a dumb American. Okay. <laughs> then it goes to 16, then it goes to 32, and then it goes to 64 and 120. It just keeps going. After 47 day doublings, which is nine months, 40 weeks, the house is ready to come forward into life and to take and an inspiration of spirit, which is the Latin for air. So you come out of being a water breather into a spirit or air breather, and your house at that point in 40 doublings is made up of over 10,000 trillion cells. Each cell is intelligent. Each cell has a function and a purpose to perform and that's all they will ever do. In spite of you blocking them, attacking them, shutting them down through your own ignorance or lack of willpower or belief in authority that wants to treat you to harm. Your body will never turn on you. It will never set against you. That is a medical lie. Whether it's a cone cell or a rod cell of the eyes, whether it's a skin cell, a bone cell, a heart cell, a blood cell, no matter what it is, it has one purpose, one, to keep you functioning and in a state of well-being from your first breath to your last. And do you know how long you're supposed to live according to your ancestors who actually used to live that long in communities that were long-lived and disease-free? <laughs> they took a look at every insect and animal and they measured the time of full completion and construction of their bodies. However long that took, you could five to seven times that and know the general lifespan of that thing. You've heard about cat years and dog years. That's all based in relationship to human years based on how long it takes a cat's body or a dog's body to reach full construction. A human body takes 22 years. That's why anciently the number 22 is the year of mastery. It's completed. You five times that, that's 110. Seven times that, that's 154. Oh, but those in authority at the pharmaceutical medical industry has convinced everybody that because of them, we're living longer. Hmm. Get in and look at the cultures and look at the studies. You're living longer than what? How many here have grandparents or great-grandparents that lived longer than their own parents? It's the truth. It's not going out there. It's coming down here more and more. It's an interesting little process we have to keep people in ignorance and to make trillions off their bodies convincing them that we're trying to help them. And again, some sincerely are. But I make two statements every time I speak at a medical community. And every time I make these two statements, either one, two, or three people get up out of the auditorium, stomp up the thing, give me a little bit of sign language. <laughs> they start throwing out expletives, and they stomp out and slam the door. And then the rest of the auditorium is so cool, they typically give me an applause. <laughs> and so I'm going to make the two statements. I usually don't do it in public, but here they are. Some of you have heard me say this. I usually don't throw it in, but I'm going to say it. For some reason, I'm compelled. <laughs> Number one, nine out of ten doctor's office calls are made by people who do not have an organic disease. They have a simple functional disorder brought upon themselves through their own indiscretions or lack of willpower. These simple functional disorders will go away on their own within three to seven days, 99% of the time. But you think you're broken. You've been taught. You need to run to an authority and be fixed. So you run to the doctor. Nine out of 10 do not have an organic disease. They have a simple functional disorder. You run to the doctor. The one out of 10 who actually has an organic disease has that disease condition because of the toxic damaging effects of the prescription drugs they were put on when they went to the doctor in the first place for the simple functional disorder. 
Yeah, let's give that one an applause right there. I hope you followed what I said. What I just said is a fact. It is a truest truth. There is no pharmaceutical prescription or over-the-counter drug in low dosages that is not toxic and damaging to you. And it will build residues over time as you are using it. If you keep going, you're going to have side effects. And it tells you right on the label. But nobody reads that crap. That's just a side effect. They don't realize that side effect was put there by marketing people, paid to do the right words for the industry. Do you realize there's no such thing as a side effect? Side effects don't even exist. There's only effects. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's true. It's like me flying into Sydney. I'm in a jet plane. I have a bomb. I want to knock down all the buildings. Just happened to kill a million people. That was just a side effect. I was after the buildings. Yeah, baby. That was just a side effect. So as we go into this thing, I'm probably going to become a little more offensive. But I just want you to understand, I'm not here to offend you personally. I'm not. And if some of you are sitting there and struggling and hating my guts already, it's all right. If you have to sneak out, sneak out. Don't yell at me. I'll have to wind up taking pain pills. That's not true. I just drink a couple of beers and laugh it off. Here's the deal. We're going to be jumping into this thing, and we're going to be talking about two passions that I have had in my life from the time I was very young. I call them the revolutions. I've been calling them the revolutions for about 40 years as being involved in the public in different ways. It's the revolution of self-care. It's coming. More and more people are waking up and realizing the powers of the autogenic, innate self-healing system of the human body. You're going to see this on my website real soon. Of a young kid, 17 years old, had his finger cut off at a construction site accidentally. He just jumped off the sidewalk to help a guy. Thing dropped, cut off his finger. He runs to the doctor. They want to do a surgery and do a capping and do the skin grafts. And, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And they're like, what are you kidding? You don't know anything. You've got to have that thing covered. He says, no, I don't. I don't feel right about it. Somebody that actually honored the intuitive knowing and would not let himself be bullied into something that his own mind, heart, and guts told him wasn't right. He even had to put up with crap from well-meaning others such as his parents. And he said, I don't care. I know it ain't right. And then he said the most ridiculous thing you could ever say to the medical community. He said it to his parents. I'll grow my finger back. <laughs> they begged him to please put down your fantasy imagination. You've been too creative your whole life. And it just ain't serving you no more. He wouldn't do it. Six weeks later, the bone had grown out to the first knuckle. The dad forces his kid into the car because he wants the doctor to see this because he wants to see what is going on. <laughs> Take him down to the doctor. The doctor looks at it and says, man, I've never seen that before. And then the doctor took credit for it by calling it a medical miracle. It's funny how they take credit for things like that. That's a medical miracle. But we got to cap it, son. You're going to wind up with infection. You're going to have pain. You're going to have things. And then we may have to cut it right back off. Kid looked at him and he said, you ain't touching me. 
ran out because he knew his dad would try to force him into the situation. Hitchhiked home. Got yelled at for it. Six weeks later, went out to the second knuckle. Six weeks later, it went out to the third knuckle. The doctor took him back in at the second and the third, and the doctor was so shocked and blown away. He took an x-ray of the first, he took an x-ray and pictures of the second, x-ray and pictures of the third, and he said, that is unbelievable. I would have never believed that. The sad part is, it's going to be ugly because you'll never grow back your fingernail. <laughs> And you're going to see the videos of all of this on the website. You're going to love this kid. Name's Jeremy Kelch. And six weeks later, that damn kid was growing his fingernail back. <laughs> Took about four to five months, and it was all the way back. He has perfect function. What a medical miracle. <laughs> and it's interesting. Yeah, let's give him a hand. It's awesome what can be done here. People go in because they don't know any better. They have their tonsils out. How many here have heard of people's tonsils growing back? Show of hands. Look at the hands. Your adenoids grow back. It's hard to believe, but a kidney will grow back. You have damage to the brain because the brain is the mo most neuroplastic organ in your body, meaning that it can convert and change and heal and repair. It grows damage and things back faster than any other organ. It's just that people will not give it a chance because authorities are just barely starting to admit that the brain has neuroplasticity and can repair and grow things. It's just being studied, especially at Duke University, Durham, North Carolina. They have 500 million to study it. It's like cancer. It's so interesting what we've done in our society. Do you realize that in 1891, there were only seven diseases? Seven. There were only 12 medicines. And they all came from plants. Here we are 120 years later. There's 10 thousand legally registered diseases that are funded and weapons of war are being developed in the fight against that disease. <sighs> Volunteer your time. Give your money to the charity. How do we go from seven diseases and 12 medicines based on plants to five, I mean, to 10,000 legally registered diseases, and now there are 561,000 patented pharmaceutical drugs. The word pharmaceutical comes of the Greek pharmako. Look it up, it means toxic and poisonous. You can't even have a patented over the counter or prescription drug within this industry with government control because they get their little tax bit. Kickbacks. Lobbyists, politicians, hmm. Pharmaceutical industry builds all medical schools. They develop, they develop all the curriculum that our good little <laughs> chanters are going to put in blanks on exams. They have been trained. But by whom? And to what end? 561,000 patented drugs. If we knew what we were doing, and I asked him this at Cornell Medical and Johns Hopkins, if we know what we were doing, how come there's more cancer every year, not less? How come there's more heart disease every year, not less? How come there's more diabetes every year, not less? How come there's more digestive problems? How come there's more joint replacements? How come there's more arthritis? How come, how come, how come? They don't know. They just know that if they had about 1,000 billion more dollars, they might find an answer. <laughs> Give now. It is so ridiculous. In 1908 in the United States, in 1908 in the United States, one in 8,000 was diagnosed as having cancer. Here we are in 2009. We've spent over $3 trillion just in the United States 
since 1908, developing weapons of war in the fight against cancer. We took cancer on, full on, 47 years ago with the announcement of the President of the United States on the White House lawn in front of all the media. Everybody got behind it. The American Cancer Society is the wealthiest charity on the face of the earth. And not once has there been one cure for any cancers. There used to be one cancer. Now there's dozens and dozens and dozens. Interesting stuff to me. But if we know what we're doing, why is there always more, not less? And everybody has to fit this margin right here, right here. We'll give you a test. If you don't fit right here, there's something wrong. You're hyper, you're hypo, you're too high, you're too low, you're too And do you realize that everybody's body is different? No two people are alike. Do you know how, and this was exposed right in their own medical journals, it was even on the news. But that's what I love about news in America. Doesn't mean a damn thing. It's amazing to me. And now they're protected because it went out to the public. They ought to know better than to come to us. It was on the news. They got 1.5 million new type 2 diabetics which is a false non-disease, published in their own journals. They call it bread and butter diseases amongst the doctors. If you come in, we'll help you to be type two. That way, I can get a kickback for the insulin that you're on and it pays for my office and my staff. You think I'm making this up. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, literally referred to within the medical community in the United States as bread and butter diseases. How come? Everyone qualifies. <laughs> Call your doctor. See if you qualify. <laughs> we all want to pass the test. <laughs> so, the way they got 1.5 million new type 2 diabetics, they dropped the glyce glycemic scale 50 points. And they got them. How many are aware of that? It's the truth. It is the truth. <laughs> so, so here it is. Here it is. Do you even know where insulin comes from? Have you ever even looked at it? Do you see where it's synthesized, the process it goes through? It either comes out of dead pigs, dead sheep, mostly dead people. And you're putting it in your body? Why would you do that? Oh, no, no, Don, they're coming up with the synthetic one. Oh, synthetic. All right. Hmm. I can't go too long on that. I got to do this. I want you to watch a video of a young girl that I hadn't seen in 22 years. She came to hear a little presentation I had done in a little town up on the Arizona border. I forgot all about her. In Las Vegas, just about seven months ago, I was doing a, an event at the Hilton, and there's just a wonderful crowd of people. I get all finished. She comes running up behind me and leaps onto my back and throws her arms around me, as ugly as I am, <laughs> and kissed me on the cheek and said, I love you. And I'm like, I love you. <laughs> you know, she gets down. I'm looking at her, and, and I'm looking, and she goes, come on, come on. I said, Donnell? She goes, yeah, that's me. She said, I want to do a little video. Does anybody here have a camera? I want people to know what you did for me and my family. I want you to watch this. Hello, I'm Donnell DiMarchesso. I am here tonight um, experiencing a, a wonderful uh, reoccurrence of memory of the joyful um, experience that I uh, had with Don Toman over 22 years ago. At that time, I had just had the second surgery of melanoma cancer. Um, I had had cancer a year and a half before and had surgery and I had a huge uh, ugly scar on my leg. 
I went the medical route, not knowing much difference. And um, a year and a half later, I had a reoccurrence. And at that time, I had been using herbs and kind of was trying to get away from the medical uh, scene, but really didn't know where to turn. It felt like my life was pretty much um, on its way out. And I was blessed to go to a health conference where Don spoke. And as he began to speak, lights literally came on as I sat in that seat. I sat on the edge of my chair, and as he spoke about this body being the temple, and the beautiful uh, way that the ancients taught to take care of this temple, to love this temple, to honor it, and uh, that we were designed to live in joy, that we were designed to live in all of our magnificence. Um, whites literally came inside of me and I knew, I knew without a shadow of doubt after listening to his speak that day that I could heal myself, that I would never have a reoccurrence. After the doctors had told me, one, I would never have another child, I could not take a chance of ever getting pregnant again because after having the malignant melanoma, it changes the hormones, the melanin in the skin, and so therefore you don't survive another pregnancy. Uh, that was more devastating to me at the time than being told I had cancer. I was only 35 years old. And um, so when I knew I could heal, then the renewal of, of all my femininity came back too. And uh, within five years, I did five fasts. I was guided by Don through changing. He went, literally went to my house, opened the cupboards, threw out everything that was plastic, threw out everything that was bottled, canned, packaged, and took me to the health food store and helped me make new choices. And his wife at that time was so generous to have me in her home, share recipes, and they helped me through my fasting. 40 days is what I would do. And I literally, it unfolded, this new health and regeneration came back to me. I didn't realize how sick I was as I regained the ability to assimilate food again and eliminate food again. And it, a whole new way of living came to me. And many, many blessings. And um, I am just so thrilled tonight to be able to share my story that it's been 22 years and I have not had a reoccurrence. I have a 16 and a half year old beautiful daughter. I did uh, remarry and we have had this beautiful uh, young woman that was, uh, has been vegan all of her life. And um, it's just been blessing after blessing. So. I just had to share my story and I, I feel really blessed and honored to have this opportunity. Thank you so much, Don Tolman. Let's give her a hand. Awesome. Through the last 40 years, I've had such a beautiful experience of being able to work with infants, toddlers, teenagers, adults, people approaching their 80s and watch them get off what they were told was their deathbed and watch them come back into life and live fully. And they've done it on their own. But it, it only seems to work if you can get enough confidence of having enough knowledge that you're strong enough to walk down that path. You can't serve two masters. You can't go over here and over there. You'll be poisoning and hurting yourself, and your body will struggle even more to get you back to completeness. A lot of people don't realize that your cells love to run at an electrical energetic performance of full capacity. But because of some of the things that we eat and drink and swallow in the form of pills and capsules that we think are natural because it says so, I've gone to 33 different countries. I spent 17 years. I was looking for a natural pill and capsule plant, and I never found one. <laughs> Maybe they're not as natural as we think they are. 
I think that some of them can be a stepping stone and have purpose for a short period. But we need to get back to some basic realities of what these cells respond to to charge their batteries back up because our capacity goes down. If you're running at half a battery charge within the system, you may feel kind of all right, but you're just not as strong as you were. You just don't, you know. And when you start following principles of health and principles of life, they cost you nothing. And that's the sad part. If it's free, it must be worthless and a lie. So far, they haven't been able to capitalize on charging you for the air you breathe. It will come. <laughs> they have attacked water and poisoned so many of the water systems. They have attacked sunshine. Sunshine doesn't even cause skin cancer, and that's right in their own publications. The number one cause of skin cancer is petroleum base and mineral oxides in sunscreen. Dr. Kenneth Nelder is a friend of mine. He's a president of the Dermatological Association of the United States. He blasted 3,500 of his own colleagues in Orlando, Florida at their national convention and said, would you please stop telling the media and your patients that sunscreen causes, I mean, the sun causes skin cancer. It is the sunscreen and a lack of fresh fruits and vegetables in the diet for too long a period of time. And again, these are studies that have been done that don't have a product to bring to market. If you're looking to use a product, and there's studies that are done to prove that it's safe and good, if I were you, I'd hold on to my money and run. This is what's being attacked. Oh, tomatoes, they'll kill you. <laughs> apples, are you kidding me? We've known for over 40 years that apples are no good. Celery, pfft, tisk tisk. A little bit of fiber, so what? Food is always attacked within this pharmaceutical medical industry. It's always a plant whole food that has something wrong. And not only that, all of the studies show that the nutritional components of food is not what it used to be. It's dropped almost 30% in 40 years. If that's true, if that's really true, and this has 30% less nutrition, which I think is a bunch of crap and helps to market stuff, but if that's true, eat two of them. Here's the deal. I've seen the spectral analysis done at Arizona State University in the agribusiness department. And it saddens me that the United States Agricultural Department 10 years ago was taken over by the Food and Drug Administration. It's been messed up ever since, and it is packed with nothing but lies. And every director that steps up and tries to point it out, fired or dies in an accident. True story. So this stuff here is attacked. Don, the rains came, washed all the good minerals out of the dirt. Our dirt's no good, therefore the food's no good. But I'll tell you what, I got this little bottle of pills. It's got every vitamin, every mineral, every enzyme. It'll balance your hormones. It'll give you a vitality you've never had before, and all you need is one a day. All you need is one a day. That way you can drink Coca-Cola and suck down donuts, and you're all right. You got everything you needed right here in this little pill. Now listen to me, listen to me. Bobby, this circle right here, that's you. And if you go out and just get two more circles, you're going to be a wealthy man. All you got to do is get two more circles. They'll be buying bottles. They'll get two circles. Bobby, pretty soon that's four circles. Almost sounds like cells dividing in the body. You're going to be rich. People sucking down pills. And then they wind up going to the doctor. Something's wrong. I got to cut this thing to the chase because we've had to shorten the time on this thing to help us get back on track for the day, so I want to do this. What if we could erase the mystery of disease right here, right now? Because every disease out there is a mystery, we are told. 
If we could just begin to try and understand the mystery of heart disease. Heart disease has nothing to do with your diet, according to specialists in the cardiovascular field. Cancer, we have no clue, it's just a mystery. Somehow you accidentally drew the cosmic lottery ticket for cancer. But come on in, we'll treat ya. So, what if we could just erase all the mystery? Because they use the mystery to create fear. And when you're in a state of fear, you have no power. And you cave in. And you just want to be fixed because you love your life and you love your family and you don't want to leave. So there you are. Here it is. This is how you erase the mystery of disease. But this is going to be so doggone simple for some of you that are so academically intellectual, you'll think I'm stupid. Well, I am. But here it is. People always say to me, Don, what's your credentials? I took the third grade twice. <laughs> you survived that. You can say anything you want. So here we go. Your body is nothing more and nothing less than a set of tubes. Your body is just tubes. Physically, that's all you are. The largest tube in the house is the alimentary canal. It starts at the mouth, runs all the way through the building to the back door. They used to call that the river of life or the river of death, depending what you were floating down the canal. Your heart is two million tubes. It's a plexi or a gathering. There's 250,000 miles of tube that run off the heart all through the house. One lung will cover an entire tennis court in tubes. There's over a million tubes in your kidney. Your bones are tubes. They're hollow. And what makes up that hollow structure is hundreds of thousands of little tubes that give us strength and flexibility. You are like totally tubular, dude. You're tubes. And if that's true, and it is, that means disease, which comes to the word discomfort, dis-ease, I am uncomfortable. It means something has gone wrong with a tube. Where's the mystery? There's only so many things that can happen to tubes. They can be cut. They can be burnt. They, they can be smashed. They can become weak in their lining and balloon and burst. And they can get clogged up. That's about it right there. And it's interesting because in all of the published journals, what it shows is that somewhere between 90 to 95 percent of all diseases is clogged tubes. And the problem is we go after symptoms. We don't go after cause. We treat in the pharmaceutical medical world symptoms of discomfort. The problem with that is, is the symptom is not only a signal that something's wrong with a tube, it's also the avenue of release of the offense. And I'm not sure you're following this. I'm going to run through a quick little deal here. Here it is. What causes the tubes to block? Foodless foods and lifeless drinks and pills and capsules and all kinds of crap that we have. Look at the people that use antibacterials. They love it in the pharmaceutical industry. That's 1.6 trillion right there, just in the United States annually. They've got us all germaphobes. Hell, I used to eat dirt as a kid and laugh it off just to make my friends think it was funny. I'm not dead. Pretty soon they were eating dirt and we were all giggling about it. We'd have dirt parties. <laughs> We'd go walking along with an ice cream cone, thing would fall off, just stick it on and keep going. <laughs> Three second rule, that's what we'd say. Three seconds? Hell, germs. There are an infinite amount of things that are so microscopic we can't see them. And the truest truth is, they were probably here a long time before us. And we live in a symbiosis with them. Unless we do certain things to where those that want to live in the house that don't belong can start to overwhelm it. And so there's simple ways to get rid of those and to reestablish the ones that are supposed to live here by design. But it's so interesting what we do. Antibacterial gel antibacterial wipes, antibacterial sprays, antibacterial, and it just goes on and on. You have that crap in your home? 
You should see the list of over 30 symptoms of disease that you're going to be going to your doctor for to figure out how to be fixed. And all you had to do was go in your house and throw all that crap away and get out of your house because it sublimates into the air 24 hours a day. And when you go to sleep and the body goes in its physiology to a lower breathing pattern, and now you're sucking it into your lungs all night long, guess what? You're going to have some symptoms you don't want. You won't even know that your own home environment is causing it. Symptom means a sign or a signal of something else. Look it up in a good dictionary. A sign or a signal of something else. The something else is an offense. Here's how the scene goes. You're walking along one day, pretty soon you're like, bleh, bleh, mm. and you feel like you need to puke. If grandma would have saw that you needed to puke, she'd have said, drink a glass of water, stick your finger down your throat and puke. Something's trying to come out. Oh, Grandma, are you kidding me? <laughs> they call it nausea. That's Latin for, I need to puke. <laughs> but we don't know that. That's a disease. Grandma, do you not realize that nausea could cause you to become dehydrated? Unless you drink some water. So there you are. You run down and you get your modern miracle weapon of war in the fight against nausea. You take the thing and it's a neurotoxin that blocks the brain from being able to signal the stomach so it'll convolute and get rid of the problem. You shut it down. You think, <laughs> the age in which you live felt like need to puke, took a pill. I'm good to go. Problem is, the offense still sitting there. You just shut down the symptom, which is the avenue of getting rid of the cause. Are you following me? Now all of a sudden you're walking along, you think you're good, you just added more poison to the original offense with that toxic drug. You don't know that. You're a good little believer. <laughs> so there you go. Pretty soon the body wakes up to what's happening and goes, whew, we gotta run this out the, ooh, I'm sorry, back door. Ooh, I got, <laughs> they call that the runs. Cause you feel like you better run. Nobody wants to deal with that crap. So there you are. Grandma seeing you at the runs, she said, girl, you get yourself in the bathroom, you give yourself an enema. Or you go down and see a colonic therapist. Those people do good things. Cleaning up the house, that's all it needs. We need to clean the house. If you don't want to do that, get a glass of warm water, take a tablespoon of Epsom salts, drink it, it'll flush it out. You're like, grandma, are you kidding me? I can't be doing that. That's disgusting. I'm going to go down and I'm going to get an anti-diuretic medication. Diarrhea is Latin for you got the run. You take the medication in the fight against the disease of diarrhea. Diarrhea, we're told, can be dangerous because you can become dehydrated. Unless you drink some water. So there you are. You take the medication, dries it all up. Hell, you couldn't poop if you wanted to. <laughs> but you're happy because you took a miracle drug. 400 million did the studies just to bring that to you. So there it was. You dry it up, pretty soon the brain gets involved, says, Bobby, yeah, boss, I'm calling down because there's a real offense in the house now and it's getting worse. I know, boss. Bobby, I thought I told you to throw it out the front door. We tried, they shut us down. The boss says, oh yeah, I remember that. Didn't I tell you to run out the back door? Yeah, boss, they dried that up. We can't get it out of the house. <laughs> boss, yeah, Bobby, what are we gonna do now? Well, Bobby, we're gonna do the only thing we can do at this point. We're gonna absorb it through the mucosal lining, through the colonic wall, put it into the interstitial tissues. We're gonna get the lymphatic stream involved. We're gonna collect it and we're gonna shove it up to the lungs. It's going to take several months, but we'll get it there. Boss, why are you going to run it up to the lungs? Well, Bobby, when I designed the lungs clear back there in the womb, I created the ability of the lungs to create huge gobs of mucus. We'll surround it. I'll create a cough response. We'll hack it right out the front door. Bobby's like, I like how you think. So there it is. Several months later, you're walking along. <laughs> Coughing. You have... Lung congestion. 
You have a cough. Grandma seeing that, say, okay, that's it. You're staying home. This is going to take five to seven days. You're going to rest. You're going to drink hot water with fresh lemon juice and some raw Australian organic honey. And it'll clear it out. And it does. Oh, Grandma. God, you are so silly. I, I, you're just old. <laughs> and you run down and get your new weapon of war. You get anti-lung congestion medication. You get anti-cough syrup. You even get some real sweet cherry-flavored cough lozenges that you can just suck on all day. And after a while, five to seven days, seems to clear it up. Boss called them, Bobby. They shut us down again. Yes, boss, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do, Bobby. We're going to have to try to run this whole mess out of the largest organ of elimination and getting rid of stuff that we have. What's that, boss? The skin. It's going to take a year. Could take a year and a half. Pretty soon, you're going to have wealth. You might have rashes. You might have eczema. You might have psoriasis. You might have a boil. You might have pimples, and you're going to think it's some kind of a mysterious disease, because that's what they're going to tell you it is. Grandma seeing that crab say, okay, here's what you do. Just cut a fresh lemon, put it all over that rashy, scaly, itchy area, do it about six times a day, and whenever you can, get out there in the sun for about 20, 30 minutes, and it'll heal it up. And it does. But you don't know that. That is too silly. You don't want to be putting lemon on you, getting in the sun, because in July 1967, and Grandma must have forgot, because it was announced that on that day, the sun came up, had changed its mind about loving people, and wanted to kill them all. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. The sun's there to kill you now, people. So, there it is. You avoid that. Over time, you run down and you get your steroid topical creams. You start rubbing it down. It doesn't let the crap out of the body. And that's all it's trying to, the tubes are trying to clean the house. That's what they do. That's how you stay healthy and vital and alive, is venting, cleaning. You vent 24 hours a day. When you breathe, you breathe in and out 20,000 times a day. You're venting metabolic waste. It turns it into gases, spews it out, takes in fresh gas. Go down and get some more crap, throw it out. That's the number one venting you have. When you sweat, oh, I'm sorry, girls, they glisten. So, <laughs> when you sweat, when you perspire, you're venting. You're cleaning the house. You're supposed to. You wear antiperspirant. You're going to have lumps. You're going to have problems. You're being set up. Google it. So then, what's going on is when you need to puke, you're venting. Diarrhea, you're venting. Stuff coming out of the skin, it's venting. You're having pain, your body is preparing for venting. It used to be called prevention. Now, prevention is a medical program for early detection of disease. Come on in early. We'd love to treat you early. We'd love to treat you 80% of the time when you don't even have a problem. That's about as early as you can get right there so there it is it used to be called fluing you build a house and it's got a chimney you got this little thing you open up if you build a fire so it'll flu it'll it'll vent you follow me if it's cold weather you shut the flu so the cold air which sinks doesn't come down into the house that's the flu oh but Don flu's a disease you get nauseous you get diarrhea you get headaches. Yeah, that's right. The body has to clean. That's what it's doing. But we treat it like it's some hideous, mysterious monster thing. Some bug floated in from some foreign country. And it's there just to get us. And it's so interesting how all of the flu seasons 
follow the Chinese calendar. Because that's where most of the vaccines come out. And you know about it. 2007, it was a year of chicken. We had bird flu. The next year was a year of horse, so we had horse flu. 2009, it's a year of the pig, so we got swine flu. I'm a little nervous about 2010 because it's the year of the cock. <laughs> there it is. You suppress crap trying to come out your skin. It's going to drive it through the air. I couldn't resist, sorry. It's going to drive it down through the epidermis, into the dermis, into the interstitial tissues. The boss is going to call and say, Bobby, they shut us down again. Bobby will say, yeah, boss, what are we going to do now? Boss say, we only got one last thing we can do, Bobby. They're not stopping. They're fighting us every step of the way. They're not walking much. They're not drinking enough water. They're malilluminated. They're afraid of the sun. They're not doing anything, Bobby, to help us here. We're going to have to build an internal self-containment unit. A what, boss? A garbage can, Bobby, a garbage can. We're gonna have to build a garbage can, construct it, and start driving everything into it. Oh, that's right, they call it tumor, which is Latin for internal garbage can. We try to act like tumors are some mysterious thing. It is not. Your cells are intelligent, it knows what it's doing. You got some waste material that's all blocked and stuffed up, and so it's trying to build it and contain it. I keep spitting. I hit you with that spit. <laughs> no? Yes? Let me get closer. I'll get you good. No. So there it is. It builds a tumor. You go to the doctor. What are you going to do? Well, we'll stick it with a needle, which will release everything inside out to the body, make things worse. It'll cause inflammation and infection, but that's okay. We'll give you some antibiotics and pain kills, and then we'll send it off to the laboratory, which has a 70% false positive inaccuracy. We'll believe in it, and so then we'll cut the lump out. Oh, doctor, after you wake up the next morning, did you get it all? Yeah, we had to take a lot of good flesh out around it, but we got it all. Oh, thank you, thank you. Just take your pain pills, your antibiotics, and you can go home. Oops, nope, you picked up a golden staff. Stay here a little longer. <laughs> Most dangerous environments on the earth is the hospitals because they use more antibacterials and antibiotics in that environment and than anywhere else on the earth. There are people that go in for a simple test and die within 72 hours because of the infection they get. And so there you are doing your good little sheeple thing. You cut out a tumor, 100% guaranteed, you're going to have more. Because the boss is going to call down, Bobby, I thought I told you to build a garbage can. We did. Well, where is it? We don't know. Somebody broke in one night and stole it. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> the boss says, Bobby, who in the hell would break into a house and steal a garbage can? He says, I don't know, boss. We think they were on drugs. There were drugs all around the site. <laughs> that was it. What are we going to do now, boss? Bobby, if these things are going to be disappearing on us, then we need to build three more. It's going to take us about nine to 18 months. All depends on where we decide to put it in its safest area to protect this body we're dealing with. But we're going to grow some more. How many know that that happens all the time? So now they go in, they can either decide to cut it out again, or they radiate it. All of these procedures are cancer-causing, and they know that. You wind up with chemotherapy, those are some of the most dangerous, toxic carcinogens that you can take into the body. But the whole philosophy is, fight fire with fire. This is a war. They think they're going to kick our butt, we'll kick their butt! Mm, mm, mm. Pretty soon they're burying you. Hey, we did all we could do. Thanks for coming in. Leave the check on the table. And it's sad. It breaks my heart. Because I've had the beautiful but heartbreaking experience of seeing the truest truth of the abilities of the human body to heal itself, to complete itself, to clear itself. But it's only when we understand principles of health in its simplest form. Your ancestors understood foods in ways that was so brilliant. They looked at a tomato and they knew a tomato, even though it was sliced the wrong direction, <laughs> a 
It has four chambers. It's red and has four chambers, just like the heart. Your ancestors believed that because it looked like the heart, it was heart food. Now there's studies that are published without trying to bring a product to market that shows that tomatoes are heart food. You know, you can look at cauliflower. They come in what we call heads. And that exactly looks like a dissection of the brain. It is the most brilliant presentation of all of the brain structures. And it comes in a head of cauliflower. <laughs> broccoli does the same thing. It's a head of broccoli. And you look at those structures. Again, it's the dendritic branch and the neurons and everything else within the convoluted mass of the neocortex all the way back to the visual cortex. And it's just brilliant what this is. Walnuts. A walnut looks like it has a left and right hemisphere, just like the brain. And when you look at it, when it's complete, it's got the upper cerebrums, lower cerebellums, it's got the wrinkles like the convoluted juridic folds. And now they know that walnuts have one of the highest concentrations of omega-3s, 6s, 9s, and the oils remove lipophysin and plaque from the areas of the brain that cause memory loss. It restores memory. So, go nuts. <laughs> they call this an almond. The Latin for almond is amygdala. That's part of the brain that looks just like an almond. And now they know that almonds target the neurochemistry of the brain within the hydronium fluids that generates emotional molecules of happiness and joy. Cool stuff. An avocado. You can look at an avocado, and I've got to tighten this up real quick. It looks like a womb in a cervix, just like the female. It has one swollen seed, like a woman who is pregnant. Fascinating, because they realize now this contains the nutritional components that our ancestors said would reduce complications in delivery. It would help a woman to lose unwanted weight. Balances female hormones. This is one of the best hormone replacement therapies that they know of. The problem is there's no money in it. And it's interesting to me because it takes exactly nine months to grow an avocado from a blossom to ripen fruit. Hmm. It's almost like this stuff could be more than an accident. It's almost like it's designed for us. A sliced carrot looks like it has an iris with radiating lines. Looks just like the human eyeball in its pattern. Ancients believed it was good for the eyes. Now we know if you eat one medium-sized carrot for seven days, it increases blood supply to the eyes by 25%. It not only brings what today is called carotenoids, and it's so funny how they market all their pills. Hi, you can get one bottle of lycopene, which is good heart food. Lycopene is Latin for red. Red food. Here's carotenoids. That's Latin for Orange food. Do you realize there are anthocyanins? It means blue-purple food. Oh, and look at that celery. The ancients believed that was a bone. It looks like a bone, snaps like a bone. It's almost as hard as chewing a bone. And now they know it's 21% phytolytic or plant sodium, and your bones are 21% sodium. And this has over 9,500 nutritional components that target bone density. Cornell Medical, in their own published studies, they tested it on 1,500 women that had aggressive stages of osteoporosis. They did no treatments, got them on nothing but raw food, got them walking and eating three to four stalks of celery this size. Every single one of them within nine months had remissed their osteoporosis. But this is published, but no one gets into it. There, there's no money in getting it out there. So that's what I'm doing. Here's what this comes down to. I've been involved in this revolution for 40 years. And now it's finally hit a point to where it's gaining critical mass. And more and more people are becoming passionate and interested about understanding health. If you want to understand disease and death, study disease and death. If you want to know about health and life, study health and life. There were three infinities that our ancestors understood in every culture. They had different names, 
But in one culture, it was called gnosis, praxis, and telicus. To know and to do and to be. That as you know something, you can do that which you know. That as you do that which you know, you become that which you do. And in that becoming, it takes you to a higher level of awareness to be able to understand new things. And so that's why they call them the three infinities, to know and to do and to be. Ever growing in knowledge, ever growing in abilities, ever growing in who we are and in the state of capacitance that we become. So that's what I finally brought after 17 years of climbing through dusty old catacombs and bibliotheques and museums and everything else looking for an ancient sacred meal that was called the meal of Hercules by one group. It was called the Teocallus meal by another group. Others called it Pulse, which was in the ancient uh, Arabic and Hebrew Essene peoples called the Zeorgim. It was supposed to be one of the most sacred meals on the face of the earth. I spent 17 years of my adult life looking for it and that's how I came across what I feel is some of the most precious information that can exist back in our world today. And I finally now, thanks to technologies, have a platform to where this is going to go across nations and across continents. I asked a couple of people, just so I could demonstrate this before I shut up here, if they would write down lists of words for me so that I could try to demonstrate to you what ancient scholars used to do in the learning method. Academics, which means trivia, was put into place in the year 326 AD with the burning of Alexandria and the murder of the scholars. Scholar means to observe. And upon that observing, you ponder. And when you observe anything out of true interest, you naturally learn and understand and then active contribution from imagination and creativity lifts you into an epiphany and a moment of inspiration where you get it. And you not only get it, you can take it to the next level and add to the base of knowledge and understanding of the people. Are those people here that wrote down word lists? If you're here, will you run them up here? Anybody? There's one. Do you mind passing it over to the side and who's ever on the end, they'll run her down? Stand up and yell out your name. Stand up and yell out your name. Yeah, Richard's um, my name. Uh, Whoa, there he, okay, who's this over here? Uh, this Richard here. Yeah, and so, and this is? Fred. Fred, Fred and Richard. You wrote down these words from your own memories and imagination, true? That's true. And you yeah. kept them until just now. In other words, I didn't take them, look at them, true? That's right. Okay. Thank you for doing this. They saved us a bunch of time. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Hope this works. <laughs> I had them write it on blue paper. I actually gave them the blue paper and, and they wrote this down for me because we all have a photo retentive color. And it used to be taught in the ancient world. Once you've found your photo retentive color and there's methods to do that, and that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you in this thing, You'll know the colors of foods to eat on a daily basis if, in fact, on that day you're eating. But it's good once in a while to go a day without eating and just having liquids. But you're going to learn all that. But there's colors of food that enhance this capacity. And so I want you all to become functional in this stuff. But this is list number 1 through 25. And this is 26 to 50. All right, how'd that do? No, I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, to speed this up, I just need somebody to volunteer to be a judge. Oh, good. Here comes one. Okay. Thanks, man. Whoop, you got her? Okay. Here we go. Um, we won't have two microphones, so what we'll do... Oh, that's what we'll do. We'll do this list first. Which list do you have? Uh, the 26 to 50. 26 to 50. Why don't you just call out numbers between 26 and 50. I'll say a word. If it's correct, just say correct. And if okay. I'm wrong, just say correct. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I do better that way. If I miss it, just go, eh, and I'll look at it. Number 33. Number 33, is it morale? Correct. Um, 50. 50. Uh, reality? Correct. 26. Aberration? Aberration? Correct. Aberration. 46. 46, 
Preparation? Correct. 28. 28, clarity? Correct. Good. Uh, 36. 36, um, is it wealth? Correct. Good list. This uh, is 42. A couple of more, yeah. 42, cruise? Correct. Uh, 38. 38, uh, dedication. Correct. Okay, so we'll stop right there. I mean, you get the idea. Okay, and then if you'll hand her the mic over there. Thank you. Appreciate that. There she goes. She's not watching, is she? There she goes. Thanks for doing that, sir. Appreciate that. Okay, you have, uh, yeah, 1 to 25, I guess. Yeah, 1 to 25. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll just read through the list, oh. and you stop me if I miss one, okay? Okay. Do you want me to go forwards or backwards? Okay. Backwards. Backwards. Here we go. Ziffnoth moth with nia, snoth moth with nia. You guys are smart, Alec, man. You hang in there now. Okay, uh, here we go. Get my picture. 25 trees, 24 lights, 23 fax machine, 22 handrail, 21 economy, and down at the bottom, 20 is planet, 19 health, 18 money, 17 spirituality, 16 wealth, 15 relationships, 14 bus, 13 doors, 12 women, 11 cars, 10 food, 9 kids, 8 play, 7 work, 6 sex, one of my favorite things. <laughs> Bad joke. Number 5, uh, family. Uh, number 4, carpet. Number 3, plants. Number 2, table. Number 1, ocean. Got That's it? Right. Okay, Congrats. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I don't get sick. Everybody that knows me knows I've never been sick. I'll get the sniffles about every three to five years, last about three days, gone. I just suck on salt rock. Oh, that's right. Salt will kill you. Please. So my kids, and I don't know what kept happening, but I have 12 of them. I think that's why I said... Uh, Number six was my favorite one, you know. So they were born at home. They've never been immunized. They play in the sun. They don't use sunscreen. They're healthy. They're athletic. They're just brilliant, wonderful, happy people. And all of that, and never having been to a doctor in their entire lives. They've never taken an over-the-counter prescription medication. They've never sucked on one supplement ever in their lives. How can this be? I want you to learn and find out why. Some of the biggest thrills of your life is when you hear about people that have overcome some very debilitating things. And they've been able to do it because of the knowledge that you've been able to present to them. Uh, I've had the wonderful opportunity of helping just a little over three dozen people in wheelchairs that were told they would never walk again the rest of their life. They're up and walking and running. Sam Best, an Australian uh, mountain biker. We have his video. We don't have it here today to show you, but it'll be on the website. Uh, he broke his spine in three places as he went down uh, a cliff of, I don't know how many, like 100 meters or something, smashed into the rocks. They had to helicopter him out. He broke his back in three places, busted ribs, his collarbones. Uh, they told him he had to have three titanium rods, and then he'd be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. And uh, he got me on the phone with his wife, I uh, wanted to know what I felt he should do. I explained it to him. Three weeks later, they strapped him up because they wouldn't, he wouldn't allow them to treat him. And he walked out of the hospital, went home, healed on his own, had no surgeries, nothing. And he's back riding, and that was just nine months ago. He's back riding bicycle and doing. Uh, you'll see one girl, Jennifer Ritchie, uh, told she'd be quadriplegic, then told she'd be paraplegic. They cut her spinal cord in order to save function, they had to lose function, uh, told she'd never walk, and then in the end of the eight minute video, you see her running up a hill with her children. And so there's things here that we have been indoctrinated to think is a certain way, and it's time in this age to begin to question and to use our intuition, our imagination, and knowledge and experience once again, and rediscover this. I was invited into three different collections 
when I was out looking for that sacred meal for 17 years and put on four millionaire miles, I lived among, amongst different cultures to learn the wisdom of what they were doing. Um, the Vatican granted me special dispensation to see their collection, which most people never see, not even archaeologists. I spent uh, weeks and weeks in there. I came across a scroll uh, in a ceramic tube. I lifted the thing out. It was a bunch of pages they had put together, and I looked at this thing, did a translation of it slowly <laughs> using lexicons in the Hebrew and Aramaic, and it was literally called uh, Gaia. Some people say Gaia, but it was originally spelled G-A-E-A. -E -A. And uh, the title of this thing was A Mother's Call. And it literally spoke about men and women who were losing their health and they didn't understand why. And they went out and left the community they were in because they were afraid that they may make the others ill. And then they hear a voice speaking and it was the Mother Earth. And at first, you would think, this, oh, this is just a fantasy. They're just making this up, and whoever wrote this thing. But as you go into this thing and see the brilliance and the wisdom and what they learned about the sun and about the earth and the air and everything else in there, it's just moving and precious and brilliant. But it reminded me of the Carib Indians in the Caribbean, who to this day in their oral traditions proclaim that their people heard the voice of the earth because corn or mace did not exist on the earth. Botanists know that it's man-made from a brilliant putting together of cereal grains and flowers and blossoms and they came up with yellow and red and blue and white and they claimed that they heard the earth speak which ones needed to be brought together and there it is. Botanists to this day are still trying to reverse track it and see how, and they haven't been able to do it. But a lot of people don't realize that the reason it's called an ear of corn is because that's the translation into the English that they had of ear in their own tongue. The mother spoke to them. I love you people. Thank you. Thank you.